It has been said that uh, wherever we find the truth, we can be sure that we will also find those who are attempting to twist that truth and to promote lies which are sometimes disguised as the truth. And since the beginning of time, it has always been that way. As we're told in Ezekiel chapter 13, where it says, Woe to the foolish prophets who are following their own spirit and who have seen nothing from God. The Lord has not sent them to the people. And because they have spoken lies, the Lord is against them. They have misled the people by saying peace when there is no peace. So they shall fall by the hand of the Lord. Some strong words. Peter says this. He calls those false prophets, those false teachers, destructive. And why are they destructive? They're destructive because they attempt to destroy the lives of those that they influence and that they teach. So Peter says they will bring destruction upon themselves. In Acts chapter 29, Paul tells us this, that these false teachers, these savage wolves, will even come into the church and they will attempt to, to tear the flock of God apart by their lies. And as we approach the return of our Lord, Jesus tells us this in Matthew chapter 24, that things will only get worse. That many false prophets and many false teachers will arise and they will attempt to lead the people of God astray. And so he said, we need to be on the alert. We need to be aware of this. And in Matthew chapter 23, perhaps just two days before he would be crucified, that is the message that he brings, the final message that he brings to the people while he was still there in the temple courtyard teaching the people. And it is a powerful message. It is a sobering message. It is a, a message of warning, not only for the people who first heard this message, but it is a message of warning for us today. A warning to be on guard and not to follow those who spread their lies among us. And so, in Matthew chapter 23, as this chapter begins, the conversation between Jesus and the leaders of the nation of Israel has ended. No one was able to answer him as he unfolded the truth of the scriptures. And no one even dared to try to trap him any further with their deceptive questions. So then it says, in verse 1, Matthew 23, Jesus directed his attention to the crowds of people who had been listening to the dialogue that had taken place between him and the leaders of the nation of Israel. And so he spoke directly to the multitudes. And it says he spoke directly to his disciples who were also there, as well as to the leaders of the nation of Israel who were listening to his stinging words that he was about to bring against them. And so he says this, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Kathizo in Greek. They have assumed a place of authority as spokesman for God, interpreting his word, but you'll notice he says this, they have put themselves in that place of authority. God hasn't put them there. 
as the Lord said in Jeremiah 14, verse 14, where he indicted the prophets, he says this, the prophets are prophesying in my name. But he said they're prophesying falsehood. God says, I have neither sent them, nor have I commanded them, nor have I spoken to them. They are prophesying a, a false vision. They're prophesying divination and futility and the deception of their own minds. Does this all sound familiar? Well, it should. Because this is not unlike what we see and what we hear happening all around us today. There are self-appointed ministers, men who have been appointed by man, but who lack the authority of God. And so they obscure the truth. They distort the truth. And sometimes it seems like they're all around us, doesn't it? Yet, at times, those leaders, at least those leaders from the nation of Israel, did speak the truth of the word of God, which would be rather confusing for the people, don't you think? Because at times, these teachers mixed their truth with their lies and with their misunderstanding of the scriptures. Therefore, Jesus says in verse 3, all that they tell you, if it is consistent with the word of God, if it is the truth, Jesus says, do it. Poieo in Greek, respond with obedience to the truth because the word of God is still the word of God. And observe those things. He says, tereo, make it the pattern of your life to live out that truth. But, he adds, do not do according to their deeds, ergon, according to their actions, according to their behavior. Well, they might speak the right words at times, but Jesus points out that they are not living right lives, where they say things, they say many things, but they do not do them. We might say that they do not practice what they preach, right? So stay away from them. Stay away from them. Why? Because a, a disobedient heart cannot produce a life of obedience. An unregenerate heart, a life without Christ, cannot restrain the evil that is within it. And their volumes and volumes of rules and regulations and traditions that they demanded that the people follow in the name of God, those things only crushed the people under the weight of guilt and of despair. They tied them up, Jesus says, desmuo. They, they were chained to these heavy loads, fortion, these, this excess baggage, baggage that was laid on their shoulders. Weights dragged them down. What a picture Jesus is painting here, isn't he? Now, this was a yoke of slavery that these leaders were putting on the people, that many leaders put on the people, and, and no one could carry it. No one could be expected to carry it. And Jesus points out that even they themselves were un unwilling to remove that burden from the people with so much as a finger. They were cruel taskmasters. And when the people failed, to keep those man-made rules and regulations, even when they failed to keep the word of God, these leaders rebuked them and condemned them. And so it is with all religion, all man-made religion. No one can keep the law. We all fall short of the glory of God. 
And who knows how many people have been misled and abused and cheated by those who claim to speak for Christ. Who knows the heartache that these leaders have caused the people? And that's why the words of Jesus are so liberating. When he says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all of you, everyone who hears these words of mine, no matter where you are, no matter what you have done, come to me for forgiveness. All of you who are weary, all of you who are at the end of your rope, you're tired of the lies, even the lies that you tell yourself. You're tired of the sin, the sin in your life. You're tired of the disappointment, the failures, your failures, the pressure that you are under to do something that you cannot possibly do on your own. You're collapsing under the weight of that sin. Come to me, Jesus says. I'll give you rest. I'll remove the guilt, the burden off of you, and I will carry that burden myself as I die for you. And so you will be able to shout with joy to the Lord because you will have peace with God and you will have rest for your soul. Oh, that is the message of Jesus Christ. But... Like many people today, most of the leaders of the nation of Israel were not looking for forgiveness. And they weren't looking for peace with God. They weren't even looking for rest for their souls. They had a different perspective on their religion. So Jesus says in verse 5, they do what they do, all of their deeds. They do them to be noticed by man. They parade around in their religion in front of the people. Some of them put ashes on their faces so that it appeared that they had been fasting for God. They look so religious. They look so pious. They look so spiritual. While others would cover their eyes so that they would not be able to look at a woman and to lust after her. But the problem was that they would continually bump into things, and so they would be bruised and bleeding most of the time. But they measured their spirituality by the number of bruises that they had received. This is religious hypocrisy, isn't it? They weren't motivated, motivated by a desire to please God. Certainly not. They, were, they only desired to please themselves. They only desired to feel good about themselves. It says in Jude 19, they were worldly minded, led around by their selfish desires and not by a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. So in verse five, in looking at the Pharisees who were standing there near Jesus, he says this, they, they broaden their phylacteries. Well, they misunderstood the command of God uh, that is found in Exodus chapter 13 and in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and chapter 11, where the Lord said this, This shall be a reminder upon your forehead and upon your hand that the law of God may be in your mouth. And when that commandment was given by God, everybody understood that it was a figurative language. They understood that the word of God should be in their minds. It should be in their thoughts. It should be a part of all that they did. It should be a part of their lives. Well, that's the meaning of that passage. But over time, somewhere around 400 BC, the people externalized that command. And so they made small leather boxes called phylacteries. Phylacterion in Greek, which means a safeguard, a means of protection. And they put scripture into those boxes, and they believed that if they strapped those boxes to their forehead, and they strapped one on their left hand, then those boxes would protect them from evil, would protect them from sin. 
And the Pharisees, we're told, enlarged those boxes to call attention to their great devotion to God. And Jesus continues. He says they, they lengthen, megaluno, they, they exalt the tassels of their garments. Craspedon, the, the fringe, uh, a reference to Numbers chapter 15, where the Lord did say to put a cord of blue, a fringe on the corner of your robes, on the corners of the robes, put that there as a reminder, a reminder to remember, to keep the commandments of the Lord. But what did the Pharisees do? They enlarged those fringes to show everyone how spiritual they were. It was about exalting themselves, wasn't it? It wasn't about exalting the Lord. And Jesus says in verse 6, they love the places of honor at the banquets, the seats that are closest to the host, so that they are the center of attention and, and they are recognized by everyone as being important. And they love the chief seats in the synagogues, the seats on the platform, uh, the seats that were facing the congregation, which were reserved for those who were teaching and leading the people. They love those seats. And Jesus says they love the respectful greetings in the marketplace as they walked through the city and people yelled to them, praise them. And they love being called by men, rabbi, which, which means teacher, but it came to mean much more than that. It came to mean this, my great one, my supreme source of knowledge and authority. And their words were seen even to be more important than scripture. Don't elevate those men. Jesus says, don't elevate them because they are just men. But we are told in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13, that we are to appreciate and to value those who diligently labor among us for the Lord because God has placed them there as, as shepherds to, to shepherd us, to feed us, to guide us, to protect the flock of God. But don't elevate them. Don't elevate them and call them rabbi, that is the source of spiritual truth. For one is your teacher and the source of truth. And who is that? Well, it's the word of God, but it's the word of God that is illuminated by the spirit of God. He is our teacher, and there is no one among you who is superior to another. You are all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And don't call anyone on earth your father, your spiritual father, the source of spiritual life. For one is your father. He who is in heaven, he is the only source of life. And don't be called leaders, kathegetes, in Greek, ruler, master, the one who is exalted above the people. For one is your ruler, Jesus says. One is your master, the source of true spiritual direction and authority. And who is that? It is Christ, it says in verse 10. He is our master. But Jesus turns to his disciples and he says this in verse 11, the greatest among you, the true spiritual leader, shall be your servant, diakonos in Greek. This person must be willing to accept the lowliest place of service for Christ, just as Jesus came into this world not to be served, but to serve, it says in Matthew 20, verse 28. So serve with genuine humility, for whoever exalts himself, it says in verse 12, hupso'o in Greek, whoever lifts himself up and makes himself great shall be 
humble. Tapeno'o in Greek. That person will be brought low by the Lord. And whoever humbles himself in the sight of God and proves to be an example to the flock, that person will be exalted by God in the end. Perhaps not in this life, but certainly in eternity. As Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 5, God is opposed to the proud. God hates pride. He is like a warrior ready to fight against pride. But he gives grace and, and favor and blessing to the humble in spirit. This is just the opposite of the way the world thinks, isn't it? Therefore, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself under his powerful grip on your life. Submit to his plan for you, for in time his hand will exalt you. So walk humbly before your God. Throwing the weight, that heavy load all of your burdens, all, all of your anxieties, the weight of your cares and your concerns, cast them all upon him. Why? Well, because he cares. Because he cares about you. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.